let us bow our hands as we begin. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity of meeting together for our class on hydrotherapy. We ask for your Holy Spirit's leading and teaching and guidance is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so hydrotherapy. This is a quotation taken from Desire of Ages, page 824. In the Savior's manner of healing, there were lessons for his disciples. On one occasion, he anointed the eyes of a blind man with clay and bade them go wash in the pool of Siloam. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. You can read that in John chapter 9, verse 7. The cure could be wrought only by the power of the great healer. Yet Christ made use of the simple agencies of nature. While he did not give continence, and I put in here support or approval, to drug medication, he sanctioned the use of simple and natural remedies. So the Savior was there, he could have spoken and the man's eyes restored. Yet he chose to use the natural remedies by mixing some clay, putting it on the eye, and asking the man to go wash it out, uh, demonstrating his approval for the use of simple natural remedies. God's miracles do not always bear the outward semblance of miracles, often they are brought about in a way which looks like the natural course of events. When we pray for the sick, we also work for them. We answer our own prayer by using the remedies within our reach. Water, wisely applied, is a most powerful remedy. As it is used intelligently, favorable results are seen. God has given us intelligence and he desires us to make the most of his health-giving benefits. Taken from the SDA Commentary, Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 938. There are many ways in which water can be applied to relieve pain and check disease. All should become intelligent in its use of simple home treatments. Ministry of Healing, page 237. So a question, what is hydrotherapy? It can be defined as the use of water as a therapy, either internally or externally in one of its forms in the treatment of disease or injury. There, uh, you have the use of water internally, we need to keep hydrated, even in a fever situation, keep drinking fluids. You have the flu, drink lots of fluids, lots of water, not, you know, juices, but lots of water. Uh, you have a headache, you can use water, drinking an eight-ounce glass of water every 10 minutes within one hour, and it can, you know, relieve that headache. So the use of water in general but there's also use of water externally, and we're going to cover some of these this evening. So the use of water in treatment of disease is old as the practice of medicine. As early as 450 BC, it was used extensively in Roman baths, uh, where folks would soak in, you know, in water with certain herbs and so forth, and uh, um, the Romans utilized uh, this practice in treating their ill individuals. Now, there are certain underlying definitions in hydrotherapy uh, that we need to cover because where it may be referred to later on, uh, it's important for us to understand um, what these words mean. So the first one is derivative. Derivative is a measure for drawing away blood or lymph from a particular part by increasing the blood or lymph in another part. So for example, if um, I were to make the feet hot, 
as in a hotbed bath, um, and that because of some blood congestion in the head, what I am doing is actually using uh, this water, and the temperature is near hot, uh, in a distant part of the body to draw away blood from the head. And so that's an example of a derivative. A revulsive usually pertains to the application of heat followed by a brief application of cold. So it's revulsive. You apply heat, but then you come and you rub some cold, the body with cold, mainly to close the pores. Because once you apply heat, the pores open. But when you end that treatment, it's important for us to close the pores with a cold application. Now, contraindicate. So you have some indicators and contraindicators. So indicate, contraindicate would suggest that a course of action should not be used in a particular case. And the uh, opposite of that, an indication suggests that a course of action should be used in a particular case. So um, usually you would have certain conditions that would warrant certain uh, therapies, um, but, but, and you would want to do that if it, you have an indicator, but here you have a contraindicator or contraindication. Um, you want to stay away from a particular course of action. Another word, interaction, an action that has an effect on another. So one action that gives an effect on another, seeking to relieve a fever. And, uh, so you have a sedative, which is an agent that describes the vital activities to below par it is usually conducive to relaxation and sleep. A stimulant increases vital activities above par and the body is aroused to unusual activities. The vital activities are increased but to a higher degree than usual, either above the present or above the normal function of that particular tissue or organ and there are various degrees, such as mild, moderate, and marked. Inflammation, a condition in which there is redness, heat, swelling, and pain. The four cardinal signs of inflammation, redness, heat, swelling, pain. And you would see this demonstrated in individuals who have arthritis, you know, and those joints can be red, warm to the touch, swollen and painful. There are several processes combined to produce inflammation. It may be caused by an infection, such as by germs and their toxins, or by bruising, which can, or a chemical irritation, a strain of some part, as in overworked muscles. So all those are different causes of inflammation within the body. Now heat tends to collect the inflammation into a pus pocket when applied. So if you find that you have inflammation anywhere and you add like a heat pack to it, you, it would form pus. And if the body resources are so stimulated that the inflammation is now reduced or scattered without collecting pus into an abscess, there will be less tissue destruction. But pus is actually formed from dead tissue products or dead tissue destruction, uh, edema, fluid, white blood cells, and sometimes tumors. So those uh, combinations of items that would be that would form pus, and um, here you also see that any time pus collects, it is best to drain the pus from the tissue to promote quick healing. And rather, if the pus is not drained, it would need to be reabsorbed into the circulation and uh, eliminated from the body, which is a slow healing process. So whenever you see pus 
you know, it might be an access um, within, say, by a tooth or um, any access along the body, it's better to drain it than have it drained rather than, than to apply something for it to just dissolve within the body. Vasoconstriction, an agent that causes the diameter of blood vessels to get smaller or constricted. It is used to strain muscles to prevent, sorry, used in a, a strained ankle to prevent blood congestion that causes pain. Um, so any, um, anywhere that you see if you sprain an ankle, um, you want to use something that would cause the blood vessels there to be constricted to reduce the pain in that area and usually you would apply ice in such a situation. So another method of using, and that's a method of using water in an ice form to create this vasoconstriction. Now a vasodilator is an agent that causes the diameter of the blood vessels to get larger. So the opposite of cold is heat. When applied, will cause the blood vessels to expand. So what, at what temperature is water considered to be hot? So we have different degrees here in Celsius and Fahrenheit. Um, so cold could be, or very cold starts off at 0 to 13 um, degrees Celsius. And you can work your way up from cold, cool, tepid, warm, neutral, hot, very hot, painfully hot. Uh, when we're doing hydrotherapies, we do not want to be painfully hot. Um, you want to be hot, but not painfully hot. Um, so in um, hot within the Celsius range would be anywhere between 38 to 40. 38 to 40, and um, and so Fahrenheit would be hot, 100 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Very hot would take you above 104 to 110, and painfully hot temperatures would be 110 to 120. When working with hydrotherapy on individuals, um, usually individuals would use their hands. Uh, to test the temperature of the water. It's always good if you ask the patient, you know, how do you feel? How is this water feeling to you? Because it's the patient that has to endure what's happening. Uh, at times, too, it would be best if you had, like, a thermometer that can um, be dipped into the water solution uh, to gauge and measure that um, temperature. So what are three forms in which water is used? We have solid, liquid, and vapor. So solid as in ice, liquid as you would have cold water, liquid water, or hot liquid water, and then you have vapor that can be applied if you're doing a steam and, um, and, and, use, and vaporizing uh, the room or your nostrils or head. So what are three advantages of hydrotherapy? Uh, one is that it is easily applied to the skin surface. There are no negative side effects as compared to a drug medication. Um, it helps to remove toxins from the body. It can be applied locally to the, the specific area and it is inexpensive and readily available that it's available to the poor and the rich. No matter where in the world you are, you can use water therapy. What are three, so you know, in your question, you had to um, give three advantages, but you would see here um, for our teaching, we give more, um, more advantages than is required in your workbook. Now, name three effects that hydrotherapy has on the body. It removes congestion. So an area that is congested, you can use water therapy to remove it, to relieve it. Uh, it increases blood circulation. It stimulates the immune system. 
it increases white blood count. And that is, uh, you know, quite important to note because a lot of times individuals would ask the question, what can I do to increase my white blood cells and my white blood count? So using um, hydrotherapies and even heat treatments would trigger the body to um, produce more of these antibodies to fight off um, a, a situation. Because, say for example, if you had an infection, your body would trigger heat, as in the instance of a fever. And uh, that heat, it's friend. Fever is friend, not foe. And so that heat actually causes the body to produce more white blood cells to fight off the infection. And, uh, and so by doing that, um, the, it builds your immune system and healing comes in the long run. So the use of heat, water, um, that is applied to the body, you are creating a fever-like kind of environment Thus, you're triggering off the reproduction of the white blood cells. Now, hydrotherapy also helps to open the airways, as you can use them in with the vapor by inhaling that warmth um, of air, and that helps to just open up your, the bronchioles and um, the nostril passageways and so forth. Uh, hydrotherapy also helps to promote rapid healing as we would see with hot and cold applications. Um, it imparts a sense of well-being. Water is invigorating. If you feel dull, simply take a bath. And a lot of times with our working with sick individuals, they're laying in a bed all day. If the temperatures may be off, they may be warm, you know, sticky. You see the babies all the time and you give them a bath and uh, they feel so more comfortable. And sometimes individuals have like skin irritations, you know, and you give them a bath or apply, if they can't be, some, you know, getting to a shower, you can simply rub their skin down with a cool rag and dry them off. And it's so refreshing, so it lifts the well-being. What are some unfavorable, unfavorable reactions in hydrotherapy? So you can have a, a headache and failure to occupy a heating treatment to the body without cold compressed to the head can cause you to get a headache. So if it is that we say, okay, let's do a hot foot bath or a fever bath where you submerge yourself within some water, hot water, but you don't put a cold or cool application to the head, then what happens is that the heat also goes to the head, causing congestion, causing too much blood within that area and triggering off a headache. Uh, then another unfavorable reaction to water treatment, hydrotherapy, is uncontrollable shivering. Uh, somebody may be so cold uh, that they shake and shiver. Another is palpitations. Uh, hyperventilation, faintness, and nausea. So we want to avoid getting these situations when you're doing a hydrotherapeutic treatment. All gospel workers should know how to give simple treatments that do so much to relieve pain and remove disease. Ministry of Healing, page 146. Give two important points to remember about the room before giving a treatment. So when you want to do a, a hydrotherapy treatment, um, you need to prepare for it. And so that we're going to share a couple uh, therapies to use and the, how you build towards preparation for that. But even the room is quite important. So one, you want to keep the room uh, warm and free from drafts, cold air that's just, you know, a striking inlet of cold air. And the room must be warm, meaning that when you start to remove clothing from the individual, uh, that they don't feel chill. 
and uh, or or that the room itself is not cold. You want to keep a um, bright light out, so you know you want it to be calming, so it shouldn't have you know have some blinds that the bright light can be managed and controlled. Keep the room quiet. Wash your hands frequently to avoid passing on infections. Uh, you might be dealing with uh, and working with an area um, where, where it's exposed. Uh, you have infections. You may have pus and so forth. Um, you know bodily secretion. So you want to keep washing your hands. Some, you know there may be times you may need to use gloves to handle certain things, but generally. Um, you want to just simply wash your hands regularly. So what are three important points that you need to remember before giving? So you want to plan a, before giving a treatment. You want to plan ahead for the treatment. Have all the tools you need on site. Know the diagnosis of the patient. What conditions this individual has. You must be able to understand and know their history. For example, if the person is diabetic. And then you want to be able to keep the patient modest and covered. So you don't go uncovering the entire body, but you only uncover those portions that you need to be working with. So for example, if it is that you're doing a cold mitten friction on the body, you want to you know, wrap like a rag around your hand and uh, be if, and it's a cold rag and you're rubbing that body, you will rub, say, one arm, the full length of the arm. But the rest of the body would be covered with a sheet. And then as you move on to the other arm, you cover this first arm you worked with, and then you uncover the other arm, and you work rubbing a cold uh, or whatever what is, um, therapy you're using, you work on the other. What are a few other points that you need to remember about treatment? Um, don't leave the patient unattended. Uh, you monitor the reactions of the patient. So if the person sh you know, sort of um, cringes because it's too cold or some application is too hot, you, you be mindful of that and you ask the question, are you okay? Because uh, sometimes if you don't ask the question, they may just keep silent and, and bear it all out. But that's not right. So ask them, are you okay? Are you comfortable? You're sure? Let me know if anything is too harsh for you. Um, especially when you're doing the, the hot treatment, you don't want the, the water to be too hot for them because what you can tolerate may not be what they can tolerate. And then you explain step by step the procedure as you go along. Once you explain individuals the step-by-step -step procedure, you are better able to get them cooperating with you. And you're keeping the person, you know, sort of having their mind working. They know what is coming next. Uh, and they're better prepared to receive it. And, um, and they just simply cooperate. And you don't have any problems with individuals as long as you explain to them step by step what's going to happen. Uh, you know, individuals love that and they respond favorably to it. Never talk to the patient about their sickness while treating them and do not talk to others about the conditions of the patient in their presence. You know, you may, you know, conversations can go the wrong way and they keep positive and cheerful at all times. You're doing a, a, a treatment, a therapy, you do what you need to do and that's it and you move on. What are three points you need to consider uh, again before you start um, the treatment? When did the patient eat? You give at least one hour after a meal to prevent indigestion by working on, on these things. It's the same as you know when you finish eat you don't go shower one time because you're drying the blood away from your digestive organs to the skin. Um, so you, with the hydrotherapeutic treatment, make sure it's at least an hour after a meal. 
Um, when did the patient exercise? Uh, you wait for a normal heart rate uh, and then 10 minutes more before you begin any um, treatment. Always insist that the patient rest 30 minutes after the therapy to complete the treatment, and this is quite important. So, for example, if you do a hot foot bath, when you're finished and you dry the feet up and you put it up, let them lie for at least 30 minutes to complete the treatment. And uh, so the same thing goes to for uh, full body massages and so forth, and the individuals need to lie still for at least 30 minutes after to complete that um, treatment. Patients must be warm to start um, off with hydrotherapies. So it's better that they're warm and then you introduce cold rather than you come and introduce cold up front um, to the body because you will get the shock effect um, on, you know, on the adrenals, a shock effect with um, their pores and they may not recover well from it and they may just go into shivering. So it's easier if you have warm applied and then gradually you introduce cold. Know that patient is always right. If they say the temperature is too hot or too cold, make adjustments so that they are comfortable. What should you do if your patient starts hyperventilating? So if you see that the patient is breathing too fast, uh, you can get a paper bag, put it over the face and the mouth um, of the patient and ask the person to breathe, breathe, breathe until he or she feels okay and breathing restores to normal and uh, so you, if you see that happening you stop the treatment you do not continue and you try to stabilize the individual if you notice that a patient is experiencing dizziness faintness or weariness what could be the cause and what would you do one is that the blood pressure may have dropped you want to check the blood pressure. If it is below 80 over 60, stop treatment one time and elevate the feet. You can also give them some sea salt water to drink to bring the pressure back up. So if that's if they're fainting, dizzy, um, you know, the pressure may have dropped on them, which is quite common once you start applying heat. Name three general effects of heat vasodilation, meaning the blood vessels expand. It improves oxygen delivery from the red blood cells. It increases the heart rate because the person, you know, to accelerated heart rate. It increases the respiratory rate to breathe deeper as well. And it increases body temperature. It increases the number and mobility of the white blood cells. So let's look at a hot foot mask. A hydrotherapy treatment in which the feet is placed in a basin with gradually hot water to improve circulation in the feet and legs and relieve congestion in other parts of the body. So you use the hot foot bath. This is what it looks like where you actually have the feet in a basin with water that is not warm, it's more on the hot end. So what are some of the indications or symptoms that would require the need for a hot foot bath? So if you have um, short, it, so it can shorten cold of, or influenza. So if someone has the cold or they have influenza, they can use the hot foot bath. If individuals have a headache, or chest congestion, um, internal congestion anywhere, nose bleeds, pelvic cramps, or you know the pelvic region is just like cramping that time of the month for ladies. Draw the blood away. Make a derivative reaction action here by drawing the blood away in your feet. So you do the hot foot bath. Toothache, fatigue, nervous tension, fever congestion of the eyes, air aches, sore throat, gallstone, renal colic, sweating, uh, abdominal pain. It's used to warm up the body. 
even in prostate conditions and high blood pressure, you can use a hot foot bath to reduce that high blood pressure. So here are some contraindications for precaution or precaution for a hot foot bath. When would you not use a hot foot bath? If you have loss of sensation in your extremities, such as in your feet, you know, neuropathy in the feet causes your nerves not to be sensitive enough, so the water may be hot and extremely hot, and the individual would not be able to tell. And we find this most present in individuals who are diabetic, if they are unconscious or paralyzed, or if they have poor circulation in their feet, the nerves may be affected. And those individuals, we will refrain from doing a hot foot bath with them. There are other methods of hydrotherapy that we can use for different conditions rather than using the hot foot bath with these individuals. So how do you go about doing this hot foot bath? Remember, the we begin with preparation. So you want to have like a kettle with hot water. That's how you're going to get your hot water. And you have a pitcher for ice water, so like a jug that you put some cubes of ice with water in there. You also want to have a bucket or a basin that's deep enough to cover the feet three to eight inches or just above the ankles. So it's wide enough so that individuals can place their feet side by side comfortably within this bucket or within a basin. And it must have a low height. So you can bring the water like three inches, four or five, up to eight inches high as you may need. Certainly the water must be above ankles. Then next you do need to get some washcloths. So a wash rag. You also want to have a face towel, and then you want to have a general towel. You want to have blankets, sheets at hand. A bath thermometer would be useful, or you can also have a brown paper bag um, if, in the case someone is hyperventilating, and you would need to have a plastic bag to protect um, you know, the, the sheeting area, the area that you're working in, um, you would want to protect the area. So you put a plastic bag around the work area. So what are some of the steps for the hot foot bath? Um, you would place the plastic bag to protect the floor. And uh, so as water um, runs out or spills and so forth, your floor is, is not, you know, unprotected. You have your plastic bag there. It could be a garbage bag that you simply open up wide. Then next you want to have a towel on top of that plastic, so cushioning the area and also to take care of any water spills, but more use for the towel we would show. Next you want to have a bucket um, or the basin with a hot water um, and that goes, you rest that on top of the towel. Next, you need to have a chair. So you're putting the person to sit up in a chair, and then, um, then on the ground, you have the basin with the water. And um, so next, you want to have a sheet on top. Um, so you have the chair, then you place a blanket on the chair, and then you put a sheet on top of the blanket that is on the, sh the chair. Reason, when the individual um, sits on the sheet, you will be able to wrap the body with the sheet first and then a blanket to maintain warmth. So the other part now you have um, uh, on the side a jug with ice water and then you have two washcloths and that's set on the side. Now you put the patient to sit. You explain the treatment, what you're going to do, the hot foot bath, and you explain the steps to them. And before the, the patient puts his or her feet in the water, you start with a word of prayer. May I pray with you? And you're going to pray asking God to bless these natural remedies that you are about to, um, to, to practice and implement. And then you carefully lift the feet and you place it into water. That is not hot. 
bundle water is cool room temperature water. So the feed goes in and it's quite comfortable. Now all now you um gonna put your hand in there and sort of wave the water side by side between the feet and uh, make sure that the person feels comfortable with you, your hand is in there. Now you're gonna add hot water to this cold water. So you take a kettle and you begin to add hot water slowly, slowly as you wade the water back and forth. Now wading the water sort of prevents a concentration of hot water in one corner where you're pouring the hot water. So the, the water spreads across. Then you ask the patient, is the water too hot? Is it um, a little cold, um, cold or is it warm now for you? And you get the feedback. Um, once the person says that the water is at a good temperature, it's not just warm, it's, you know, it's, it's like hot, then you stop adding the hot water. Now understand that your hand is in the water. You watch the temperature your hand would be feeling, it's feeling hot, but to you, you may think, well, this water could really be a little bit more hot, and, uh, but the patient says it's good. Listen to the patient because the temperatures that your hand can take, your feet cannot take. Your feet are so sensitive that it, you know, the heat can be, can be hot and can be super hot to your feet, but to your hands it may feel comfortable. So listen to the patient and stop when they say it is hot. Now next you want to wrap the sheet around the patient and the sheet will be draped over the um, bucket that is warm and then you drape over the blanket, you pull the blanket wrapped around the patient and you allow the person to sit there, what would happen is that the heat as it's under them, um, it comes up under these wrappings and the sheet and the blanket and so forth and really gives heat to the body and uh, so the, the person will feel hot, they will begin sweating. It is at that time that you add the rag with the cold water. So this is what you do. You take the rag, you sort of fold it um, into like about a two inch, um, so you get a two inch in diameter at the end of your folding. You dip that into water and you wring the edges of the rag, and so the rag is now cold, and you rest that as a compress upon the head, uh, upon the forehead of the individuals and the edges of it falls around on the side of the face. You can also take the other rag um, as it's cold, you wet it in the, in the cold job and you can wrap that around the neck too. What that does is that it prevents that heat from going up into the head, into the brain, and causing blood to be congested in the brain. Um, and, the, and so you really want the heat to be drawn down in the feet. Another reason for wrapping the patient, especially with those who have heart problems, if um, from the time you begin to add the hot water to the feet, you find the blood is going to be drawn down to the feet from the, the head top. And, um, and so as it goes down, by once you have the coverings about the chest and around the body of the patient, you find that the blood comes down gradually rather than rushing past them. And if that does, then you can get some flittering around the heart area and cause them, you know, cause problems. Um, so applying the cold to the head, um, is another way to have the blood be drawn down gradually, wrapping the body always, um, especially for individuals with heart situation, is another means of getting that blood to be drawn down gradually. In addition, the wrappings also help to provide um, that sweating reaction that helps you to get rid of toxins, that helps to break a fever, that helps to um, you know, to remove and, and, and move away um, congestion in the head or in the lungs and so forth. 
and you know that heat will help with um, those kinds of things. So now you're going to do this hot foot bath for 20 minutes. You don't want to do it longer because it loses its effectiveness. And then you don't, if you do it for too short of a period of time, then again, it's not going to be very effective. So for adults, you want to run the treatment for 20 minutes. And um, during this time, and, and so for children, you do it for half of the 20. For children, you do it for 10 minutes. Now, during the time while you have the individual there, give them water to drink because you want to, they're going to be perspiring. You want to keep the body hydrated. You give them water. You also um, want to prevent dizziness and, and so forth, so it's good to give them water to drink. Um, now, you may find that if the atmosphere is not very warm, that that um, hot in the, in the pan um, or the bucket can lose its heat, um, probably it's an AC environment or whatever, so it may lose the heat, you can add more hot water to it, but you keep checking with the patient and see and how, you know, getting them to cooperate with you in terms of maintaining that heat, that temperature. And, uh, so, you know, um, once, once the therapy is ended, you will then seek to remove the blanket in layer, remove the blanket, and then remove the sheet. And then you take the feet and you lift it up and you pour the cold water over the feet. What this is going to do, it will close the pores um, of the feet. You take, you remove the pan, you remove the bucket or the basin, and then now remember you had a dry towel under there you press the patient's feet down carefully, and then you use that towel to dry their feet properly. You dry all in between their toes. You really dry everything properly. There may be times, too, it would be good. You can put on a socks for the patient and then allow the individual to lie, or you just cover their feet with um, a sheet, and you allow them to lie there quietly for 30 minutes to complete the treatment. So if they are resting, you don't wake them up in 30 minutes, you know, you can give them a little bit more time, up to an hour or so, and then you, um, they would get up. So note that if patient can sit for a long time, um, this uh, hot foot bath can be done while one is laying down as well. Okay, so just to review the, um, the photograph, this is what the hot foot bath looks like. And so um, let's look at the fever bath. Um, I wanted to share with you that there are times when you can do a fever bath. It's used for breaking a fever if one has cold or influenza, if you have pain all over the body, have high blood pressure or a sore throat. Um, whereas with a hot foot bath, you're sitting and it, or laying down with your feet in a basin. For the fever bath, you're actually um, getting into a bathtub that's filled with hot water and, um, and making yourself comfortable in there. So adults will do it um, 10 to 20 minutes where you submerge your entire body in the um, in the hot water, and you can wrap a sheet around that body too, but the water is hot. Again, use the rag to cover, um, to put on the forehead, um, have your water to drink on the side. So for adults, you can run that for 10 to 20 minutes, and for children, you can run it for 5 to 10 minutes, and for infants, only 3 minutes, where you may have like a big bathtub or big buckets where you put them in to break a fever. Um, so one, say if you have a fever, you don't ha necessarily have to apply the cold um, because, but you can use sort of like fighting fire with fire. So you can use the heat in a fever bath to break that heat. Um, I want, also want to um, share that with the hot foot bath too, um, you can have, um, say if you have headaches. So I remember at one time, I had a throbbing headache, 
and um, it just lingered on for me with me most of the day into the night and uh, I had gone out um, at that night to look at turtles so I got back home um, late and uh, um, and so with the late night and so forth my head by the time I got home was just throbbing I felt um, you know such great pain and really uncomfortable that I asked in our, um, my family just to help me get some hot water into a bucket and to begin doing a hot foot bath as I dropped into a chair. And I, um, you know, just got my feet in there. I put on the sheet to drape me and so forth. And uh, with the cold rug to my forehead, I ran that hot foot bath for 20 minutes. And thank the Lord, at the end of the 20 minutes, the fever, the, sorry, the headache was gone. So at the end of the 20 minutes, there's no headache anymore. And that was such great relief. And there were no side effects as if I had taken a medication or a Panadol or so that would have tremendous side effects. But here you have a natural water situation um, and therapy that was used. Another um, therapy is fomentation. So fermentation is the application of a hot, wet cloth or towel to a part of the body that is very, it is very effective and can be used to treat a variety of diseases. And each hot application needs to be followed by a cold application. So for example, um, a fermentation, you can have a heating pad at the back, at the back here. Um, and you can also use towels that can heat it at the back and then you drape also um, that hot towel, the entire towel is hot and you put that over the chest area. Um, again, you use the wrap on the forehead and on the side of the face or um, in the neck area too. Um, the, so the fermentations, you can heat up that towel either by boiling the towels in hot water um, or using steam to steam them up or some individuals would actually wet a towel and wrap it, put it in a bag, like a plastic bag and then put that within um, a microwave and then the heat, you know, it heats up that towel and you take it out, you shake it up if the towel itself is hot. So the, the fermentations can be used to increase circulation, to fight germs, increase again white blood, um, blood cell count, to remove body waste, um, relieve pain in the nerves, muscles, joints, internal organs, and relieve congestion of internal organs, um, such as your lungs, by drawing the blood to the surface area. So, um, you have any, if your lungs is congested, uh, you can put that over the chest and it draws that blood away from um, the organ itself uh, to free it up. And again, the heat will just expand the bronchioles, break up mucus, um, or expand blood vessels, whatever you may be trying to accomplish. So here, you see it relieves congestion and colds, pneumonia, bronchitis, asthma, uh, when it is applied to the chest and at the back. Um, it's also used to heal internal organs and just, it's soothing and relaxing. So um, that's the fermentation here. Also, when you have the fermentation along with a hot foot bath, um, and as it demonstrated in this little picture, um, you see you call that a general revulsive. So remember earlier we talked about if a patient cannot sit up for too long to do a hot foot bath that you can have them laying down and do it just the same. This is how they can lay down and again you would have the drapings of the sheet and the blanket but um, you have uh, and you know bring them like to the edge of the bed and then you may have a table where you have this um, hot um, water pan that the feet goes into and be careful that you don't have any spilling over with this.
For the general convulsive, you apply the fomentation along with the hot fit bath. So you would use this um, to increase circulation, increase the white blood cell production by four times the amount. It would also help because now you're using fermentation and hot foot bath to increase white blood cell production. Um, it would also help with relieving lung congestion, um, abnormal problems and muscle um, pains. So what are two precautions for a general convulsive treatment? Um, you want to make sure that you keep the patient covered and do not expose the chest. Be careful to keep the patient modest. So um, again, you only expose areas that um, need to be exposed. So even when you have that hot, um, that hot towel over the chest area, there's a way in which you, as you remove one, you, you're placing on, sort of like peeling off one and, and peeling on or, or sort of like layering on the new towel as you maintain heat um, for the 10 to 20 minutes in that area. So you would prepare for a general convulsive treatment if, uh, by having all towels and hot and cold um, measures in place and within close reach, have a cup with a straw of drinking water for the patient to use. I also want to share with you um, a simple treatment for using um, a hydrotherapy uh, for a sore throat. And this is what you call the compressed the throat. And it's quite um, helpful for that sore throat. So you feel the throat a bit itchy, you know, it's sore, it can be painfully sore. If you do this treatment, it works like a charm. Um, and you get relief overnight, really, by you apply it in the night, you wake up in the morning, and your sore throat is completely gone. Um, if you can do it during the day too, um, just for a couple, you know, within a couple of hours, you watch your sore throat go be in a natural form. Um, so, for example, you would apply the compress to the throat um, by wetting a rag with cold water. So you simply take a rag and you get cold water, and yes, cold water to wet this rag. So and usually you have the rag open, you fold it in half, and then in half again, and you wet the rag in with cold water, you dose it in the rag. Sometimes the water may not be cold enough, you make it like ice cold water, um, sometimes I simply wet the rag and just throw it within the freezer compartment for about uh, two minutes, and so when you take it out, it's very cold. Now this cold rag, you take it and you rest it against the throat. So just by your neck area, you put the cold rag just to the front and wrap around your neck. Then the next thing you do is that you get plastic. Um, it could be a plastic bag or um, that you make it long, you know, wide because you want to put the plastic above the rag and wrap that plastic around the rag. So you may have like, um, you know, the food wrap, plastic food wrap. You could take a big piece and you fold it to the size that would span your neck and you wrap that and cling it over the wet, cold, wet rag. Once you do that, then you can take like a dry cloth or a bandana, you um, make it to the size of the neck again, as shown in the picture here, and you wrap that over the plastic. So the plastic is going to help to maintain the, the, cold, the uh, moisture as the cold rod is rest on the neck. The plastic helps to maintain moisture, and you get a, a cloth or a bandana head tie you or scarf and you wrap that around. It's going to help to hold it in place. It's going to help to provide warmth from the outside now. And, um, and you simply keep that on overnight. And by the next morning, you wake up, you take off the wrappings, your sore throat is gone, disappeared, and you're able to feel better um, using the natural remedies. So there are some individuals who could sleep with this, um, wrap, these wraps around the neck quite comfortably. You may 
prop your pillows, you may do some adjustments to sleep through the night with it. Uh, if you can't sleep, then during the day it's fine. Um, I've actually used it in a day uh, by having the wrappings and then you wear like a turtleneck um, top and uh, so nobody knows what you have under your neck really, but it's working for you during the day. Um, you be careful with children or with the elderly. You don't want them you know, to pull these things too tight. Uh, so you're simply just wrapping it around, not putting any force of making it tight. And um, so that's simply the, the sore throat. So um, there is this quotation here to end off with. Natural means used in accordance with God's will brings about supernatural results. We ask for a miracle and the Lord directs the mind to some simple remedy. We ask for a miracle and the Lord directs the mind to some simple remedy. These remedies are quite simple. So what we've done here is actually to introduce to you a couple of natural methods um, of hydrotherapies that can be used. There are more, lots more of water treatments that can be used. And um, so there are different, like the Russian steam bath, fomentation, we talked about the hot foot bath. You have the alternate cold and hot showers. These are excellent for um, helping individuals who are depressed. You would see this recommended there. Um, in the cold and hot showers um, where you alternate them. It also helps to increase blood flow to the area. Um, you have like salt glow, steam inhalation, um, which is quite a common method that we know you get that basin, you put the heat in it, you add some uh, thing for you to inhale like eucalyptus oil and it helps to clear the lungs and natural um, in situation to have fast additives, things that you can add to the bath, like, like oats, you can add to um, that water in your bath for, to help the skin when it's maybe irritated or itching um, for, because of highs or something. Uh, and you can um, just go in, in a tub with oats water and that helps to soothe the skin. Uh, then you can have charcoal poultices that's applied and um, or to remove toxins from the body, or you can do a soap with Epsom salt to help remove toxins from the body. So there are quite a number of different methods and um, different uh, therapies that can be used using water externally um, as well as internally to help bring um, healing and relief and healing to the body. So um, these are send, you know, circulate um, these links to you so that you can simply look um, at some online presentations of, um, you know, some folks who are very much into this work, uh, having a lifestyle center and, and do these remedies. And so the videos would demonstrate to you um, in a visual way how this can be done. So thank you uh, for our presentation tonight. and. Uh, we get straight into our Q&A at this time.